Quick, you need to make a choice. You've just entered a room in a dungeon. You have to get to the other exit and your health is draining away steadily, one unit for every step you take. Do you just go to the exit as quickly as possible? Or do you make a detour to pick up a health potion on the way? We're algorithmists, so let's turn this into a graph problem in the usual way. We'll have one vertex for each location we can be in, but we'll have edges for the steps we can take. And we want to get from the yellow start vertex to the white end vertex. But hold on, how do we encode the health potion into our graph? This is what we can do. We won't just have one vertex per location on the map. We'll have one vertex for every possible game state. We can be at a location without having drunk the potion, and we can be at a location after having drunk the potion. And there's one particular location on the map where we can take the upgoing edge from not drunk to have drunk. As before, we still want to get from the start vertex S to the end vertex T. The start vertex is definitely on the haven't drunk the potion plane, and I've put the end vertex in between to say we need to get to the exit and it's up to us if we go via the bottom plane or the top plane. We wanted to get to the exit as efficiently as possible, and each step costs us one unit of health, and drinking the potion gives us five units, so let's just encode these costs in the edges of the graph. The outgoing edge, drinking the potion, will have reward 5, which we might as well call the cost of minus 5, and all the other edges will have cost 1. So this is a nice, clean graph problem. We just want to find the minimum cost path from S to T. The wrinkle is that this is not like the minimum cost path we've studied so far. Here there's an edge with a negative cost. And Dijkstra's algorithm had the precondition that all the edge costs should be above or equal to zero. So what should we do? That's what we're going to set out to solve in this video. How should we find paths in graphs that have negative costs? Actually, the first thing we should do is ask ourselves what Dijkstra's algorithm would do. What would happen if we just went ahead and ran Dijkstra's algorithm on a graph with negative costs? Here are two graphs. What I'd like you to do now is pause the video and work through Dijkstra's algorithm step by step on them with pen and paper. Start from the vertex labelled S and see what effect the negative weight edge has. Just one quick comment. I don't like using the word cost when it can be negative. To me, the word cost makes me think of positive costs and so it pushes my intuition in the wrong direction. So from now on, I'm going to switch to a more neutral word, weight. Instead of cost, I'll talk about the weight of an edge or the weight of a path. And instead of distance between two vertices, I'll say minimum weight between them. OK, so now pause the video and work through Dijkstra's algorithm on these two graphs. Here's the code for Dijkstra's algorithm in case you don't have it in front of you. Press play again once you've figured out what's going on. What you should have found in the top graph is that Dijkstra's algorithm found the minimum weights correctly, though it did end up pushing a vertex back into the priority queue after it had been popped, which it never did on graphs with positive costs. And on the bottom graph, it hits an infinite loop. As a programmer, you've got to be very afraid of infinite loops. They're your worst enemy. If your program gets stuck in an infinite loop, your users will hate you and the other programmers in your team will hate you. I always try to avoid playing while statements wherever I can to make sure that even if there's a bug inside my loop, it won't make my program freeze. So let's look at this infinite loop a bit more. Let's look at the bottom graph and let's think about a minimum weight from S to T. Here's one path. The simple path consisting of just one edge, which has weight 2. And here's another path, S, T, U, V, then back to T, which has weight 2 plus the sum of the weights around the cycle, which comes to 1 in total. Or we could go around the cycle twice, and that would give us a path of weight 0. Basically, by going around the cycle enough times, we can find a path of arbitrarily low weight. 
as a sensible convention, we'll say that the minimum weight from s to t is equal to minus infinity. And this here is the culprit. It's this cycle of negative weight, weight minus one in this case. If there is a cycle of negative weight, then we can get min weights equal to minus infinity for at least some of the vertices. And this is what basically made Dijkstra's algorithm get stuck in an infinite loop. So what should we do? Let's start with something that you may have spotted while you were running Dijkstra's algorithm. Let's suppose we're partway through the algorithm and we're trying to compute the minimum weight paths from S and we're storing a value min weight at each vertex, showing the smallest weight of a path that we've found so far. Now, Dijkstra's algorithm has an update step, which works like this. Let's say we're looking at some vertex U and we scan through all the edges out of U and let's suppose we find an edge from U to V of a certain weight. What we do then is we ask ourselves, does this give us a better path to V than what we knew before? In this case, we've previously found a path to U of weight 15, and we can extend it to get a path to V of weight 17. And if 17 is less than the best we had previously found for getting to V, then hey presto, we have an improvement. We'll update V dot min weight to be equal to 17. This update step is called relaxing the uv edge. And here's what it looks like in pseudocode. We say if u dot min weight plus the weight of the extra edge is less than v dot min weight, then update v dot min weight. And that, in fact, is all it takes to make a short sparse algorithm. It's called the Bellman Ford algorithm, and it says just relax all the edges in the graph over and over again. Okay, well, it's not quite that simple. First, Bellman and Ford figured out that you only need to run V rounds of relaxing all the edges in the graph. In other words, this procedure will definitely terminate. Second, they figured out what to do about those pesky negative weight cycles that we came across earlier. Here's the full algorithm. It starts off like Dijkstra's algorithm, setting the min weight to infinity everywhere except for the start vertex, which gets weight zero. We can think of this weight zero as being a zero edge path, if you like. In Dijkstra's algorithm, we said that we can get from a vertex to itself by not doing anything at all, which is effectively a path with zero edges, and we assigned it cost zero, and so we're doing just the same thing here. And the infinity is a stand-in for, I haven't yet found any paths as it was in Dijkstra's algorithm. Next, we do this edge relaxation trick on every edge in the graph. We do v minus one sweeps, where v is the number of vertices. Now, the clever bit. Do one more sweep of edge relaxation and ask, did this change any of the min weights? If it did, the algorithm says, this graph has a cycle of negative weight, and if it doesn't, then it just returns the min weight values. We really ought to state a proper theorem about what this algorithm does. Here's the theorem. I'll give you a moment to read the statement. Basically, this theorem says the algorithm does what we want it to do. It's good practice to write out a proper statement of what we want the algorithm to do and to explicitly flag all the possible outcomes, because if we don't have a proper statement of what we want the algorithm to do, we can't even begin to reason about whether or not it works. I'm not going to go through the proof in this video. You can find the proof in the lecture notes that go with this course. The proof isn't hard to follow, it's just one of those proofs that needs careful statements and careful checking that we've dealt with all the things that might go wrong. And that sort of proof you really need to copy out yourself on a big sheet of paper. The proof is examinable. Um, what, what I mean by that is, in the exam, you might well be asked to invent your own proof for some other algorithm, but using the tricks that we find in the proof for this algorithm. So not only do you have to learn the proof, you also have to spend some time thinking about what makes it tick. And the best way for you to do that is to approach it like a hacker, looking for counterexamples, as we talked about in the last video. OK, that's enough waffle about proofs. Let's just review what we've been looking at here. We've been studying two algorithms for finding shortest paths, Dijkstra's algorithm and the Bellman Ford algorithm. We noted that Dijkstra's algorithm can get stuck in an infinite loop if some of the edge weights are negative, whereas the Bellman-Ford algorithm always terminates. 
And the reason we're interested in negative edge weights is because they let us solve all sorts of planning problems, like deciding whether or not to pick up the potion on your way through a dungeon. What about running time? Well, in the happy case for Dijkstra's algorithm, when all edge weights are above or equal to zero, then the running time is big O of E plus V log V, whereas Bellman Ford is big O of V times E. The Dijkstra running time is better. Think of a tree, for example, where E equals V minus one, which would make Dijkstra take time big O of V log V, but Bellman Ford would be big O of V squared. And the bigger E is, the worse Bellman Ford gets. That's just the price you pay for being able to deal with negative edge weights. Lastly, both Dijkstra and Bellman Ford use the edge relaxation trick, but Dijkstra does it elegantly and efficiently, whereas Bellman Ford does it brute force. Dijkstra visits the vertices in a very particular order, which ensures that it never needs to re-relax an edge, whereas Bellman Ford might relax an edge on every pass. And this is basically why Dijkstra is so fast. OK, so that's the Bellman Ford algorithm. Let me just finish with a few words about Bellman and Ford. Bellman and Ford both came up with this algorithm independently in the 1950s. Both of them were employees of the RAND Corporation, which is an outfit that does research and analysis for the US military. It was big during the Cold War, and clever algorithmic people like Bellman and Ford were drawn into problems to do with planning and logistics and so on as opposed to the last couple of decades when clever algorithmic people were drawn into advertising and social media manipulation. Bellman is in fact the inventor of dynamic programming, and what we'll be looking at in the next video is another way of solving the planning problem but using dynamic programming rather than this edge relaxation method.